You can absolutely record it, 100%. Okay, awesome. Good morning, oh, Alfred. Cool. I have a lot of stuff that I just started, too, and I could really show how I start. Good I morning, start good there. morning, oh. good morning. Good morning. <laughs> You're on time as usual. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm like three minutes early. You are three minutes early. I'm, I'm grateful because, you know, yeah. it's hard for me to get my students to show up on time in general, mm -hmm. but then on time on Fridays, it's like a double whammy. For some reason, everybody thinks they can sleep in late on Fridays, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. a rainy one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Albert. <laughs> Good morning. Albert, this is Heidi. Okay. <laughs> I think Heidi woke up early for our session today. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I got out early. I, I usually, no, actually, I think I woke up a little bit earlier as well. I might have slept in on this nice rainy day. <laughs> so, all right, that was good. So yeah, if you want to, um, I think I'm, I'm probably, so class doesn't start until 9.01, but I have to give five plus minutes for the kids to roll in. So if you are in the mood to like turn your camera off and you're in your turn everything off and come back in a few minutes, you know, to give yourself 10 minutes, yeah, sure. collect yourself and Perfect. whatever. whatever. Yeah, of course. Sounds great. Good morning, Nicholas. Good morning. Thank you for arriving to class on time, yay. I'm glad that you are um, not missing this session. Let me ask you, did you make it to um, the other two last week when we had Curtis and the one before that with, with John? Um, I'm not sure about Curtis. I think I had John. So last week was Curtis Young. And then the week before that was the film editor. No, yeah, I only saw the film editor. I didn't see. Okay. Okay, well, I am um, recording these sessions and I'm putting, I'm going to put them up into um, a, a classroom website. <clears throat> so, good morning, Mr. Fogel. Good morning, Ms. Brooks. Nice to see you. Good morning, Mr. Fogel. Good morning, Albert. It's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, a bug is trying to catch me, but I'm trying to kill it. Oh, no. <laughs> not feeling well? Oh, my goodness. That's, that's I'm sorry to hear that. What's, what's happening? Just congested uh, and runny nose. <sighs> oh, man. So sorry to hear that, Mr. Fogel. Yeah. Well, you're my, my fellow holistic. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Get, break, out, break out the neti pot and the elderberry and all the- What elderberry I got today? Pardon? Oh, you did buy it yesterday? Yes, elderberry. I have burdock root and I have yellow dock. I'm going to get some um, raw honey today. And some zinc. Yes, zinc and zinc. That's on my list. And taking okay. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. Perfect. Mm. Mm. Perfect. Good morning, Andre, and good morning, Daniel. And we have morning. Tree in the house. Good morning. Thank you guys for for coming to class on time today. I'm grateful. I am going to, we're gonna wait. Um, I'm gonna wait at, at, at least five minutes um, before we yeah. start. Yeah. 
So you can, you can take a, a peek right now. <clears throat> Heidi's, Heidi's studio is in that little, is in one of our little squares, right? Mm. You know what I'll do? I will um, pin that. There we go. So you can, <clears throat> you can have a sneak peek inside before she gets here. <laughs> Ew. It's like, it's like peeking into somebody's window. Ooh, there she is. She's walking. <laughs> you know she can hear you. Y yes, she can hear us, actually. Of course, of course. Okay, so let's see. Hello. <laughs> Hi, you can hear us? Can you hear us talking about your space? <laughs> no, I didn't hear. I'm back. I was in my other part of my space. Good morning, everyone who's arrived. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am, I'm playing like doorman. So with Zoom, the person who is the host, um, all of my students, they, they kind of queue up in a waiting room. Uh huh. And I, I have to individually let them in one by one. So, so, so I'm, I'm playing doorman. Um, those of you who did arrive, um, this is Heidi. Happy learning. Uh. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes. So currently we, we have, um, let's see, my students are a mix. Students that have arrived so far are coming from um, all of my different classes. So I have some students from some seniors, primarily seniors right now, um, some 10th graders and some 11th graders. Oh, nice. Yeah. And all um, your students are somehow connected to the arts. Yes, they are all inside of one of my three art classes. So they're either in digital photography, digital art, or AP art. Nice. This is the first year that we're teaching, that I'm teaching um, an AP course. So that's, that's new for all of us. And um, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging and a lot more work. <laughs> And most of your students, you said, are from Brooklyn? Yes. That's really great. Everyone here, um, those of you who are, who are present, all of you guys live in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Great. Love Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, so the school, so, so um, let's give it a few more minutes before I get started. Sure, yeah. Good morning, Melody. Thank you for joining us on time. Good morning, Ms. Brooks. Good morning, Mel Melody. Good morning. Don't listen to him. Stop it, Andre. Stop it. Please. Stop it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Okay, so you know what it is. Um, oh, yep, yeah, my mic is on. Okay, so it's 9.05. I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to have some more students that will likely trickle in. Um, so everyone, this is, this is my friend and, and, and painter. Um, she, her name is, is Heidi Lanino. And um, Heidi graduated from Pratt right here in Brooklyn. And um, I'm going to let her introduce herself to you guys. Well, good morning and um, thank you for having me. I'm really uh, happy to share my space and my process and any questions you have, feel free to um, ask through our time together. Um, but again, yeah, my name is Heidi Lanino 
and um, I'm, fine, I'm a fine artist. I'm a full-time practicing fine artist. I also was uh, an educator. I teach art and I also was an art director at L'Oreal. So I kind of know a different points of design. I grew up in Long Island and I, um, so I, I lived on the island for a long time being uh, Long Island to Brooklyn and now I live just outside of the city in Tux, right, right outside of New York City in Hudson Valley. Um, but yeah, so I went to Pratt and uh, I love Brooklyn. So you're all from Brooklyn, which is a big heart of, for me. Um, I mean, I went to school there, I got married there, I had my children there, I love Brooklyn. Sad to leave it um, and I still go often. So, uh, and Pratt um, is obviously in Brooklyn. And if you have a chance to go there, I would recommend going to their campus. They have a really beautiful sculpture um, park and garden there now, which um, was not as big when I went there. And it's really lovely just to walk around, especially now during this time. Like, I'm not sure if you'd have access, but you can always walk around and see all the sculptures. It's a real beautiful location. Um, That's a great suggestion. I have actually... Yeah never done that. I've never visited yeah. Pratt or walked the campus. Yeah, well, well, I went in the late 80s, 90s, and I'm sure all of you are much younger than I am, but that was a very different Brooklyn and Pratt than now. It was very edgy, um, definitely dangerous, and I loved going to Pratt during that time. I really did. A lot was happening in the art world, um, musically, um, writing, art, it was just a lot happening. And I kind of liked the rough edge. It was really a great time to be in New York City in the, in the art world. Pratt now is very fancy. It seems very fancy and elegant. A lot of other people have moved in. So it has a different vibe than when I went there, but I still really love going back to Pratt. They have really interesting buildings and um, a lot of times they have, uh, I'm not sure now just with the pandemic, but they have a lot of portfolio review and you can visit this campus and go to the different departments. So it's a real nice walk around. And like I said, it is within a certain gate. So Pratt does have a campus and that campus has a lot of um, sculpture. So, um, so, so I have a quick question. So, so our students here, obviously, we are, they're all in high school. Um, what did you, what, how, what type of art were you making in high school and how did you decide to go from high schools to specifically to an art school? Um, well, I have an older sister. She's two and a half years older than I am. And she was always really involved in art, even more so than I was. I think I just didn't quite realize that I really was as well because she was always the painter in the family. I was more um, someone who was really good at art, but I loved nature, um, animals, horses. So I was more active. And um, so my sister ended up, she wanted to go to RISD actually. Um, but she ended up picking Pratt and she went to Pratt. And the day that I moved her in, when I was in 10th grade, she was just like, oh no, this, I don't know. Like she wasn't a hundred percent comfortable. And I was in the back seat going, this is the most amazing place I've ever been in my life. Even though it was rough and edgy, I was like, oh, I'm going to art school. So I kind of, that, that kind of started um, the idea for me. And so I was in 11th grade and I was like, oh shoot, I have to make a portfolio. Like, how do you get into art school? I better make a portfolio. Um, and I went to a high school in Long Island. You dropped your sister off when you were in 10th grade. No, no, 11th grade, sorry. Yeah, it was the beginning of 11th grade. And um, I was kind of late to doing a portfolio. I was like, oh shoot, I better start doing a portfolio because how do you get into art school, you know? I was like, what am I gonna do with my life? I'm, I'm good at this. This is something, um, I was very aware that I was a visual thinker. And I think that's always a good thing to know is what you're not good at and what you're good at. And I solved things visually. Like a lot of my, most of my paper reports, I basically got the better grade because of the cover or the art. I was not a fabulous writer. Um, I've gotten better, but it was not something I was naturally good at. So my covers and my art always made my grades a lot better throughout school. So I started realizing that um, I was very naive also to how many jobs are in the art world. Like now that I teach, 
and I have a, a classroom of students, I'll say, oh, there's my fashion designer, there's my industrial designer, there's a photographer, there's the painter, there's the architect. You can see someone's asset. Like once you've gone to a, a good school, like um, Sarai's went to Parsons, I went to Pratt, your education is just heightened and you're with amazing talented people. So you start realizing that design is in everything. Creative thought is in everything. And I did not know that going to art school. I thought it was about fine art. And most of the art schools, and they're still- Can you like, define fine art for <laughs> the next set? Can you define fine art? Yeah, and what I find mm -hmm. interesting is, so, so fine art being um, going to, I, so I looked into Pratt and said, all right, I better start this portfolio. And like I was saying in high school, I didn't have a very good art department. And I didn't really love my art teacher. And that was unfortunate. I just really didn't, um, just didn't connect to this particular art teacher. And we only had one. We had one art teacher, one photography teacher. That was it. So my schedule didn't work to be in his class. So I asked if I could be in his younger class and just work in the back. So it was perfect because what I did is that he would tell me the assignment and I'd just be like, mm, yeah, that's okay. I don't think I'm going to do that assignment. Not, not because he, if he was a better educator, I would have been more willing. So what I did is I would ask my sister, so what are you doing at Pratt? You're like, so what's going on? So I would ask her what she was doing in her classes. And then I looked online and saw what you had to do for your portfolio. So it was pretty easy. So I had my own structure. I didn't really want to do my teacher's lessons because they weren't truly about me. They weren't my personal reaction to something. And that's really important. You want to always make sure that it comes through you and it's about you. So I just made my last that that year that art session about portfolio development i had to make a portfolio so that's what i actively worked on um by myself in the back and would just talk to my sister and see what she was doing at pratt um were, so, you, oh, the yeah, pratt other, were you doing the pratt assignment so if you found out her her assignment was no not really i just liked the way they were thinking i just okay. loved the way they were thinking and the way the teachers would inspire thought um, it was a different way of thinking. And I, I still teach that way. I don't always teach, um, I don't teach like a specific type of art. I teach more creative thought and the process will teach you through it. And that's what I noticed is suddenly this language that my sister was speaking um, was, I understood it. I, I was like, oh, I want to go to this place. I think these people think like me. I, I, this is a world I belong in more than academia. I wasn't as good in school. And luckily back then, um, I'm not sure if this is for you, Soraya. I mean, I wasn't the best um, student, but I was good. But, oh, here's one weird thing. My lights in my studio are motion detected and I have to move around. I have to fix that because it's the worst when you're painting and then your lights go off and then you have to like move around to get your lights back on. My landlord has motion detector lights. It's awful, but anyway. Um, so, uh, now I lost my frame of thought. Well, I, I'm going to interrupt you here with a question. So many of our students that are on the call right now are seniors and they are inside of an AP art course. And many of them are also applying to art programs and art schools. So right now we are in the beginning of finding a personal theme to focus on for the year. So can you speak to that? So when, when you were in 11th grade and you decided, okay, I need to make a portfolio to get into art school, had you thought about um, a particular theme or a particular focus? That's question A and question B is, what is your advice to my students who need to work on their portfolio. Articulate a particular theme, a personal theme for themselves. Yeah, great, great question. And um, I think it's also a little complicated because um, I, I actually went to Pratt when I was still 17. I was like one of the kids that's the youngest in your grade. And I didn't realize that until I was in college that some people were held back. And I would have loved that extra year of maturity. 
And the reason I speak to that is when you speak about themes and uh, a body of work, you're, you're too young. Like I felt too young. What was I going to say yet? I was still experiencing life. I was still figuring out who I was um, and what I wanted to say. So it's kind of a tough position to be in because you're young, yet you have to do this portfolio. And back when I applied to Pratt and art schools, your SATs and school grades were not as important as your talent. Your talent would trump that. Not, oh, I don't want to use that word right now, but it would bypass that is, is the meaning of the word. Overall, overall. Right. And um, so your talent could get you in and not just your grades. Um, now I know that art school is a bit different. So, I mean, in one way, the portfolio um, has not changed much because I look into them once in a while when I have students that are applying to schools and I'm shocked that it's the same. It's the same portfolio that like, are, are you shocked too, Soraya, that we're, we're doing the same portfolio? It's the same portfolio requirements. Yeah. So, so part of it is that that's helpful. It's really helpful. They ask for a still life. Okay, I have to do a still life. But that still life doesn't have to be a still life that 50 people could do. Like, I'm not, I, ha I haven't met you all. I just see your names and I know you're from Brooklyn and I know a tiny bit about you. I would assume that your personal still life objects are going to be so different between every single student. And it really is felt if you take these objects that, I don't know, it could have been um, a grandmother's or your great grandfather's or something that you bought in, um, I don't know, in, in the village or something that you picked up or acquired in your backyard or on the street. Like what are these personal objects and why? So that would be a way of having your personal, um, the way you could tell your story through a still life, a self portrait. Self-portrait, we all have to do a self-portrait. It doesn't have to be um, representational. It could be abstract. It could be representational. But you obviously are going to have to draw yourself through that portrait, not just a realistic um, rendition. So there's so much opportunity through each thing that they ask for you to personally bring yourself in. Then I, I, I don't even remember all of them. I know it was a still life, I know it was a portrait. And then um, I remember having to do some natural things, you know, like nature. So I remember drawing some of those. However, there were some freedom pieces and I believe that's what got me in to Pratt. And I was really, um, like I always didn't want to draw it because girls are always associated with, oh, they like horses. I loved the rhythm of horses. And what I mean by that is that I used to ride when I was young. I would ride a horse. And I believe that um, for me, most of my work was about movement and motion. And I personally chose this particular animal to kind of feel the way I move through the world. And what I mean by that, if any of you have ever been on a horse, you're a certain, like, I don't know, you're about five feet above the earth, but you're below the sky. And it's this movement that you're not just moving by yourself through the world, you're moving with an animal that also exists on this planet. So it was the way I chose to feel and move through the world. That was why I like to draw horses. But I knew that when you draw them, like, oh, it's a girl that likes horses. So I was not always wanting to depict them, but I did this big painting and some drawings of horses. When you were younger? For my portfolio. Okay. So that's what I mean is that was something that was meaningful to me and I put it into my portfolio. So what was meaningful to all of you? What is something that's more meaningful that only I would draw them that way? Only I came up with that. What would you come? I don't know if some of you are bike riders, runners, boxers, jewelry makers. I, I don't know. I'm not swimming. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what you do, but tap into that because your truth will come through it. Um, so that, I have a feeling that those pieces um, that were not the standard do this in your portfolio, so that's a continued theme, yes. speaking about a theme that I still work on and I will for the rest of my life and, and, and force and movement because that's my symbol of beauty, freedom, and strength for a woman and it's a horse and I still go back to it every, every year I go back to that.
So it's a continued theme. That's beautiful. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, here, here's a funny thing too, is I didn't, I didn't apply to many art schools. I was extremely lucky. This is not the norm. There was a poster in the hallway about applying to Pratt because Pratt was really dangerous in the 80s. There were a lot of murders. There was a lot of crime. International students weren't coming. They were losing money. So what they did is they made a scholarship, a full tuition scholarship if you apply to Pratt. So I didn't apply because I thought, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make that. That's not going to work for me. But I went to Portfolio Day. And the reason I'm sharing this is go to Portfolio Day, to any art school you want to go to. It's really important. I went to Portfolio Day. I met my sister. We're having a great time. Pratt's looking. It's my first time ever showing my portfolio to people whose opinion I valued. Um, another um, piece of advice, when you go to Portfolio Day, bring somebody else with you and have them take notes. You will not remember anything they say to you because you're going to be nervous, you're going to be unsure, and they're talking about your work. So you're vulnerable. Sure. Sure. Bring a person with you to tape it, to write it down. You will forget everything. I'm telling you, very important to remember what these professional people say. They're so good. They're so um, willing to share information. And it's really valuable for you to reflect, go home, and work on your portfolio. But what happened to me is this woman named Claire Romano was there, a printmaker. And she looked at my portfolio and said, did you apply for the National Scholarship? And I said, oh, no, I, I didn't apply. She goes, well, go downstairs and get your work photographed. I think you should apply. I said, OK. So I got my work um, photographed and I applied um, about, so I hadn't gone to, I went to Parsons, did I go to Parsons? No, I went to SVA. I never even got to Parsons. I got a phone call from Pratt that I won one of the scholarships. So I got a full tuition scholarship to Pratt. Wow. Because I happened to go to Portfolio Day. I happened to meet Claire Romano who happened to suggest I get my work photographed, and I happened to be one of those four that got a full tuition scholarship to Pratt. So I am not the normal person who applies to a lot of schools. I didn't apply anywhere else. Why would I? So I went to Pratt. So I know and I truly believe in the magic of timing. That was magic of timing. That was not, there was plenty of other talented people that would have gotten that slot. But I happened to be there on that day. I was open, I listened, I went downstairs, I did everything they asked me to do. And I just happened to be one of those lucky people. And I don't always believe it's just talent or it's just luck or it's just, it was a matter of me. I really wanted to go to Pratt. That was my school I wanted to go to. Now in retrospect, I almost wish I went to a multidisciplinary school because I loved theater, I loved dance, I loved music, I loved art, set design. I loved it all. And I've kind of, once we do a little visit in my studio, you'll see that I play with a lot of materials because I really like a lot of materials. So anyway, that's my story, which isn't the norm. However, believe in those magical moments and be open. Be really open to possibility um, because you never know what's going to happen. So, and, and believe me, I have many um, failures also. Like that was a success. That was a happy success and a chance to do something. But there's many of failures and I really believe you learn more from the failure. Thank you so much. Heidi, this is really, really amazing advice. I think I, a ta one takeaway that I would like you guys to really focus on after what? hearing what Heidi said is that you guys need to just show up. Mm -hmm. So if you see portfolio days or you see Saturday workshops and frequently I am posting these events sometimes in the classroom, in the real classroom, and now in Google Classroom, to, to really consider them and take them seriously and to just show up. Because that's uh -huh. how these opportunities will arrive in your lap, is by being there. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely hosting. And you um, meet really great people. You really do. And especially, um, like I think that it's so lovely to be in a creative field, because you're with people 
that generally share, like, like they share process, they share information, they share. And I really think that when you're, when you're open and you're open to possibility and you're willing to share yourself and your knowledge, things move in a good direction. They just do. And do know that um, the failures of not getting into something or not doing well, just keep working, push through it because it makes you more genuine and just more human to know the good and the bad, the positive and the negative and the struggle. It really, um, I think one thing that I try to teach my students is to be, to learn to be really comfortable by being uncomfortable. It's generally where you learn in that space is when you're uncomfortable, it means you're learning something. You're progressing. Like when I'm too comfortable, I'm just repeating. I'm re repeating and repeating. It's that uncomfortableness. And sometimes like I liken it to an athlete when they run. I'm not a runner, but I can understand what happens to them chemically when they're running. You're running or you're playing any kind of athletic. There's the switch. And it's suddenly this weird high in a zone that you don't even know yet you're there. And that's when you're truly making something with your artwork. Like I tell people that I go to my studio basically every day, but sometimes I make art because I know the difference. I know when I'm making art and when I'm just studying or when I'm repeating, really learn to know the difference. And now I have to move, move my lights turn back on. See if I get back on. There we go. But anyway, I'm not sure if you want, if they, anyone has any questions or if they want you to show my studio or what your thoughts are. I would, I would love to. No, really, I would like to see your studio. Great. Um, before before we proceed, I, I'm going to ask um, for my students that are willing, if you could turn your cameras on, that would be really lovely so nice. that you have a face. Oh, I'd love to see the faces. Thank you. I see Nicholas mm -hmm. you turned your camera on and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Nicholas is one of our very talented artists. I'm not sure if I can see everybody. Oh, maybe I need to do it on a gallery. Oh, I just did exactly. it. I'm not good at this. Exactly. If you click gallery view, you'll be I able just to see it. We have Mr. Kovel here. Mr. is an amazing dancer. As you were speaking Hi. about rhythm and movement, I know that that was hitting a chord. <clears throat> and we have Miss Marsha. Oh, and Andre, you turned your camera on. Yeah, I'm really inspired by dance. Like yeah. I go to a lot of dance performances. It's yep. really, um, I, I love dance and the space that it occupies. I made, which was better than Albert. I'm sorry, I'm gonna put you on louder. I didn't hear you, Andre. So who's got some questions for Heidi before we start the studio tour? Whoa. She said some amazing stuff. Anyone else? I only see a couple of faces. Hello. And you can unmute yourselves. I don't mind interruption or question or whatever. Please do. That's what a class is about, is that you should get things from each other. You know, I'm sure you're all missing being in art class together, right? That must be so sad. There's such a an energy that happens in a class and you feed off of it. It's, it's pretty strange, all of us being in our separate space. Yeah. Yeah, it must be hard. Like, how's everyone doing? Like, do they have space to work? How are you guys doing? We're doing fine. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I love Brooklyn. I miss Brooklyn. When I, when I moved, uh, my heart dropped. I, I was so sad that I left um, a place that imprinted me so much during my creative time. So like I go back as often as I can, but right now I, I just haven't just because I'm just like, oh, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing during this weird phase. But, um, but I'm really hopeful that New York will pull through. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're tough, we're scrappy, we, we gotta, you know? Exactly. But anyway, if you have any questions, I'm gonna move around my studio and um, hopefully it'll work. It's kind of weird, the Zoom camera thing. I have you on my, um, my easel cart so I can move you around um, on wheels. But what I'll do is I'll first turn you around and feel free to ask any questions. I mean, whatever you want to ask. I do a lot of, um, like I said, as I'm, I'm an educator, so I do a lot of art. Um, oh wait, you know what I might do? I might wheel you out of here. Oh, the one thing that I love about my studio, you start I have a roll where, gate Yeah, where it reminds me of Brooklyn. I love my roll gate that I open up every morning. It's really loud and I can open it up into the hall. I'll show you what I mean. 
Yeah, so tell us about the space that you're in. Like, wh where exactly are you and what kind let me, of... Let me get the lights on. I am um, just outside New York City in Tuxedo Park. And this is a big haul I have. So I can drive my car in on a rainy day when I have to load up for a show. Wow. And I pull in to my really cool roll gate that I love because it reminds me of Brooklyn every time I open it up. <laughs> And then I have some crazy um, installation um, sculptures here. And I just showed you that. And let me pull around. So I'm kind of in like a warehouse, which I love. I'm in a warehouse building right outside of New York City in Tuxedo Park on a train line. So guys, I don't know if you can see those, those sculptures right ahead of you. Can you guess what that's made of? Like and then I'm going to show you the one outside too. Yeah, you, so here they are. I'll show them up close and I'm going to show you. Here's one that's outside of my studio as well. It's right here. And I'll explain to you what that is in a second. Let's see if you can figure out what it is. It'll make sense when I tell you. It's kind of a funny thing. What, do you, guys, what do you guys think you're looking at? What is it made of or what might it Is it made out of wood? Yep, yes. made out of wood. Yeah, I wood. thought it was made of wood too. Has it been cut off from a tree? It was at one time. It was used for something. I can tell you what it is. What these are is I do a lot of, um, I love recycled materials and I love reusing materials. And years ago with my kids, I live kind of in a really, it, it really is a beautiful area outside of the city. It's a valley and it has a lot of horse farms. So I brought my kids um, to feed carrots to some horses at this like funny farm um, near my home. And I noticed that they had thrown away on the side all these chewed beautiful pieces of wood that the horses chewed. So the sculpture that I showed you outside at first, it was all the paddock fences that the horses were chewing. And the way they chewed them, I thought was so beautiful. These are the posts that the um, fences were nailed to. And what I did is I bought furrier nails. Do you know what a furrier nail is? It's the nail that goes into a horse's hoof and shoe. And they're super soft and they're called diamond head furrier nails. And they're really, really amazing. They're soft and they go into the wood almost like butter. It's this really beautiful um, feeling. And has anyone ever seen, uh, who's gone to, I hope that you've gone to the Met in the African wing. Has anyone gone there? It's my favorite place in like the world. If you haven't, please give yourself that gift. Go to the Met, go, when, once the pandemic is over, my trick is if you go downstairs to the Met, you can go downstairs to the left, don't go to the main door. It's the secret entrance and the line's never long. You go on the bottom where the coats are, you get right in, you pay only a tiny bit because you're a New Yorker, you still can pay what you wish pay what you wish. I used to pay 50 cents when I was at Pratt every time I went. Um, you go to the Met and there's this sculpture that used to be in the front and it was an African sculpture and it looked super scary and it was full of nails. And I've been looking at that sculpture since I've been probably eight years old. It was one of my favorite sculptures in the African oceanic wing. And it was a sculpture that was full of nails and it looked scary, but I was drawn to it for some reason. I kept being really drawn to the art and I wasn't scared of it, but it looked scary. And what it was is, uh, if you know that sculpture, I forgot the name of it right now, but it would be, a, it was a sculpture to scare away spirits, to scare away bad evil. It was protective. So it was a protective sculpture. So I loved that sculpture so much. So these particular pieces, what I do is every year I do a new one. And each nail has an intention of something that I want to get rid of or I want to add to the world. So it's a personal reflection. And if you've ever done, I don't know if any of you have done any carpentry or nailing, but there's a beautiful rhythm of hammering, of the motion, the sound. And then I brought an intention. So every single nail has a new intention. And for me, politically, um, it started when our new president was voted in. That's when I started these. So I make one each year and I make new intentions for the environment, the world, and things that I want to happen. So those are intentional pieces. So I do a lot of work like that. Um, I also, um, 
I do a lot of work in ceramics. I don't know if any of you work in clay, but I, I love working in clay. I tend to do it in the winter. I'm a hand builder. I draw and paint on clay. So I don't really consider myself a ceramic artist. I consider myself a painter and a drawer, but I do a lot of ceramics. It's really healing. I love touching the clay. I love working in the clay. Can it you come up so with good. That? Oh, sure. This is one that's inspired by Asian art. And I, I, I just love cutting clay. And I, what's that? I said I would actually buy that if I could. You are awesome, Nicholas. One day, maybe you can become a collector. There's always a friends and family discount if you come and visit me. Always a friends and family discount. But anyway, so basically, like you can tell, I'm just drawing. I'm drawing on clay. That's all I'm doing. I'm doing the same thing I do on paper and other things. And I have a whole bunch of different ones that I have here. I believe in that case, is the clay, oh, is the one. clay start as a, a white color clay and then you put a black on top of it? Um, yeah, like I'll show like here, here's block. another one. Here's the one that, so this clay you can see more. It's the same kind of drawing, but it was white clay. And then I paint it with a slip. A slip is pigment and clay together. And I let it dry and it's called leather hard. It's my favorite time. Like, have you ever touched clay when it was leather hard? Um, it's the most amazing feeling. It's cold and it feels of earth and it's just such a lovely tactile experience. And then I use a looping tool and you, it's a, basically just a wire loop and you draw into the clay. So you're removing the clay. And that's how I create it. And then I push paint back in and I do all different kinds of stuff with it. They're beautiful. Um, so I have a whole bunch of different clay pieces um, that I have. Um, I also work in, I'm not sure, I'm trying to see how, what you can see. Oh yeah, here's a big, um, I work sculpturally. Like you, you see this woman right here, she's in wood. It's all recycled wood. I did it at a residency and um, saw. Oh, if any of you want to ever work at an amazing residency and you can go there for free and learn all these different crafts, it's called Salem Artworks, Salem, New York. It's amazing. A lot of young artists donate their time and you live in these tiny mini houses and you can learn how to weld, um, blow glass, sculpt, and you can sometimes work to get the studio time. So I was a resident artist being able to use the studios, but all the young artists were there um, living for free because they worked. And that was something that, like, I don't know about you, Soraya, but that wasn't available when we were in art school. No. Most of these people, I know that once they graduate college, they go to residency, to residency, to residency. And what it is, it's a way of you have a place to live, they generally feed you, give you rent, and then you get to ha work, and then you get to make art. So a lot of art students, they don't get jobs after college, I noticed. They would go to residency, to residency, to residency, which is an interesting thing when you're young and you have no commitments yet. It's a great thing to do. So anyway, so that's where I did um, this work. Then I, I work really figuratively. So I have a lot of work that is um, like, here's some sculptures on the ground that are made out of paper and metal. This is a paper sculpture that actually, um, someone said about dance, um, it it's called a maquette. A maquette is a little sketch of a sculpture and it's a paper sculpture that spins and turns. Wow. And it was a sketch um, because I donated it to the Baryshnikov um, Arts Foundation. I go to their benefits for a couple of years. It's an amazing educational program in the city. And um, it's definitely inspired by dance. So this is a maquette of a sketch that was built much bigger for the event. Um, I fold my drawings and paintings a lot. I cut them up, I fold them, and I do different things with them. They're all basically figurative works. Um, here's just stuff on cardboard. Like I just do things that, on anything, like, you know, recycled cardboard, paint it, cut it, sculpt with it. We actually just did a, a little, um, we all made accordion books on recycled cardboard. Oh, I love accordion books. Aren't they the funnest? I, I love making books. Like, they're so fun. I mean, here's a piece that, um, these are some drawings that I had done. Like here's some figurative drawings that I had done. And then I had cut them all up and now I'm making a collage out of them. I just did this yesterday. 
So I work on the floor a lot, so my knees sometimes hurt, but I just cut up all my sculpture um, drawings and then I make them into a sculpture. Or here, like I cut up my art sometimes and then I make them into sculpture. Wow. Over here, you can see the, here's some sculptures that are, there's my awesome roll gate, which I love. Um, here's some metal welding. This is like the first welding job I ever did. And it's the same design as the wood one. So I did all of this at um, Salem Art, the residency. And then I'll show you over here. So I'm pretty lucky. I mean, I have a big studio. It's about 1600 square feet. So I'm pretty lucky that I'm able to work. Here's all my paints on the floor. I just leave everything on the floor. I'm a bit messy. It's so kind of what, my messy what paint mess. are you using? What kind of? Say it again. What kind of paint are you using? And can you speak to us about that piece that's um, hanging on the wall there? Um, which one? The hanging one? The mobile? No, the painting. The one on the wall right now? Exactly. Um, okay, well, what I do is I work in um, acrylic and oils. Sometimes I start with acrylic because it's just easier and quicker and it dries. So I do an underpainting in acrylic. Okay. Other times I keep the whole painting acrylic or I use it um, with oils. So this particular piece is, um, I have a couple of different series. Um, like obviously the sculptures that you see, they're from my Folded Female series. It's called Folded Female. It's trying to depict like a woman, uh, like universal skin for all women of how we particularly deal with the world right now as women. So they're called Folded Females and they're kind of inspiring this piece a little bit. But I also have a series that is, um, these are from that, that are inspired by the masters. And, um, when I was, the one biggest gift I think my parents could have done for me is like, we, we grew up in Long Island. We didn't have a lot of money. We basically went camping most of the time, but most of my family was from Europe. So we would save money and we would go to Europe, but we'd stay a little bit longer because it was cheaper to fly back. So having that education of going to Europe and understanding the world is really big. And the other thing that my parents did that was really, really smart and imprinted me and educated my aesthetic and I so strongly was that we went to the Met a lot. We lived in Long Island and my dad grew up in Manhattan and he kept um, a dentist in Manhattan. So every time one of us had to go to the dentist, my mom would say, let's go to the Met. So we went to the Met a lot. And I didn't realize that until I was at Pratt, that that imprint of constantly like being really little and not understanding what you're looking at, but feeling it was a huge education. So I can't, I can't say it enough. Look at as much art as you can. Absorb as much as you possibly can, whether it's music, writing, art, sculpture, and put it all in your backpack. Put it all in your backpack. Steal, take, borrow, get inspired. Put it all in your backpack. And when you're making your work, select what you want and it'll become you. It'll become part of you. So I really feel that um, this particular piece that we're looking at right now is a beginning. It's, it's probably my favorite time mm -hmm. of making work is the first touch, is the beginning. Um, I photograph my work through the stages because sometimes I wish you could delete and go back and be like, oh, rewind. I want to go back. That piece was so much better three stages ago. Um, and luckily with phones and um, printing, we actually can print it out, you know, from a couple of stages ago. But this particular piece is a painting that I've been thinking about for probably two years. And it reflects on the masters. Um, some of the masters that I love is I love looking at, um, I love looking at Asian art, um, African art, um, Greek art, um, and the masters. And one of the masters that I would reference a lot is called Delacroix. If you ever want to look up Delacroix and look at his drawings, I always tend to look at artists' drawings, sometimes more than their paintings. I really feel that, um, you can understand how they think when you look at their drawings. It's almost like looking at their sketchbook. So I reference a lot of painters by looking at their drawings. This particular piece is actually Bruegel. Um, it's a Bruegel painting and it's called the um, Fallen Angels. 
And it's basically, it's so crazy when you start looking at art and history, how um, everything repeats itself. Th this painting was inspired by Bosch, but it was done by Bruegel. And it was basically about heaven and hell and good and bad and political issues and life issues and politics. There was even someone called the Orange King that was involved in this painting. So I've been thinking about making this painting for some time. And I sometimes reflect to the masters to help me deal with what's going on in my world now. Because I really believe that um, the masters, it's not old work, it's work that's gonna exist forever. And it inspires and influences us forever. So you always look at history to see how it impacts the present and the future. So I reference master paintings and interpret them in my way and express them in my way. It's a series, talk, speaking of series, I have my equestrian series that's about horse and movement. I have my master series where I reflect the masters and interpret it now through me. And then I have my um, folded female series, my abstract figurative. So those are the series that I tend to keep going back to. And my ceramics is a bit more of a connect to earth and beauty and the world. So um, it's really great to keep building upon series. And these are series that I've been doing for, uh, oh my goodness, for years, you know, probably for 20 years, I've been working on all of these series and you build upon them. So this particular piece, going back to it, is the beginning sketches and first washes of that painting um, by Bruegel, which is the Fallen Angels and how um, politics and um, opposite opinion and evil and good and duality, how it affects the present world. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow. Does anyone have any questions? Do you feel your series will change? Um, will my series change? Well, I, I think, that, I mean, they, they definitely do. Like, I, and what, that's a great question because I have some drawings in the other room and um, sometimes what happens is that I, like when I come into my studio, um, I sometimes feel like, oh my God, do I, does my studio give me ADHD or do I have ADHD? You, know? <laughs> like you walk in here and there's so much going on. I'm like, okay, I can work on this painting, the floor, the wall. But sometimes I stop everything that I'm working on and I just have to make something new. And this particular series that you see One here. Second. I want to see, do any of my students, can any of my students tell me what, what art media is Heidi using in these drawings? What do you think she drew these with? Uh, it looks like either with pencil or pen. Pencil or pen, those are good guesses. Anybody else have some ideas of what you're looking at, what art media? An ink press, I think it's called. Ink, okay. Anyone else? We've got we've got ink, pencil, pen. What else? Markers. Pardon? Markers. Charcoal. A really good guess. And what was the last thing I just heard? Charcoal. Yes. Is that Nicholas? Yeah. Okay. Beep. Bingo. Number one. My it's, favorite it's too thing dark in the world. It could be anything is else. Charcoal. I'm very. I'm always messy. My hands always look awful. I love charcoal. I love charcoal so there, much. There's something that, that I know that you do, Heidi, when you are drawing with charcoal that um, one of my favorite artists, Matisse, used to do because he was bedridden. So Matisse used to do something so super cool with charcoal that Heidi does. Can you speak to us about that thing um, you do? Yeah, I should even show you. What I do is um, these particular, a lot of times I attach charcoal to a stick and I stand back and I draw from afar because what happens is that you get the gesture of the drawing when you are using your body physically. Like, um, uh, like I can show, oh, like here, like see these, this horse painting over here? Here it is. And I'm gonna go get something. This is, um, these are actually, this is a horse painting. Let me see if you can see it. Can you see that? We can, yes, that's a good, that's perfect right there. I'll turn it a little bit. There you go. Let me just go get something to show you how I actually did it. So can you guys see the forms of the horse in here? Mm -hmm. I'm trying. 
So because her lines are so broken, what does it make you see? Does it look like they, like those horses are standing still or does it look like, do you see motion because of those? It looks movies? like multiple horses on top of each other. Like I can see multiple heads. Multiple heads? Exactly, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And it, what's interesting is that, um, so now you can start connecting some things that I spoke of. When I was really little, there was an artist at the Met called um, Rosa von Herr. And she, what was interesting on many levels, also for the girls in this particular class, is um, it was huge. The painting was um, probably the size of my entire studio wall. And it was the painting for the Met. And it was called um, The Horse Fair by Rosa von Herr. And um, I was maybe 10. And I, I was overwhelmed by the size of it, the beauty, and the feeling. It was... Um, it was like passionate and, and wild and dangerous and, and comforting and strong. And it was so many emotions, but I was too little to really understand them, but I felt them. And my mom whispered and said in my ear, and she said, and it was done by a woman. And I just thought that's interesting. Never understood what she meant until I was at Pratt and realized, oh, there's hardly any women in museums. That's why she said that that the painting that impacted me the most was actually done by a woman. This painting looks really nothing like it, but it's my reflection of it. I'm referring back to that painting and I'm referring back to knowing what it feels like to ride on a horse. And the way that I did that is this is charcoal attached to a reed. I just tape it, I just tape it on. And my drawing starts from out here. The drawing begins in the space before I hit the canvas. And then I move that line and it goes again. Like, I, I don't know if you understand that or if they're making sense, but my that line starts before I ever touch the canvas. And I move it and it touches the canvas and then it goes. So the reason I do that is that's the feeling I want, but I'm more interested in the space between me and my peace. And I hope that when people look at my work, I'm inviting you into that space, that space of where something exists or how you could come into the piece. That's really what motivates me with my work is how do I invite someone else into that space? It's almost like, um, like I, I believe that most of the songwriters of a modern day, they're poets, they're mostly poets that write music. Um, I don't care what kind of music it is, it's generally a poet approach to the lyrics. And it's kind of that gray of poetry that my work, I don't always want to explain it. I hope that the gray of the piece invites you in, if that makes sense. And then back to these drawings. So this is a really fun tool. If you ever want to take charcoal to a stick and draw with it, it's super fun because it changes your line and doesn't make you so aware of the line that you're drawing. You just let it happen. These drawings, um, I'm a female, so I tend to do a lot of female bodies. It's just the way I connect to drawing. But I started these with my eyes closed and I use both hands and I try to find the form and they're definitely connected to my folded female. It's like when things aren't, like I just can't help but um, have a hard time breathing through some things that are going on in our world right now. So I sometimes just come in my studio, put a big piece of paper up, I just close my eyes and I just start drawing. And that's what the, this particular series is about. So it's kind of my way of beginning um, and I'm usually supposed to be working on something else and I just can't help it. I just have to make another drawing. It almost helps me find my center of balance and calm. So um, that's what they're about. Um, and then, oh, these are kind of cute and fun. Um, these are little sculptures of, um, these are little metal sketches, sculptures. Okay. And it's my folded female on metal. And I have them small and I make them big. But sometimes I bling them out and I put uh, crystals on them. So these have. Oh, whoops. I think she froze for a moment. Yep. I want to ask her how she did that. Aren't they cool? Hopefully, hopefully she's going to reconnect if, if um, she will either unfreeze or 
she'll have to uh, rejoin the meeting, which, which might, might be necessary. Um, I'm surprised she stopped and talked to us today. She probably would have been doing something else right now. Yeah, she's, she's a very, very, um, she's a very prolific artist. Do you know what that means by prolific? She's like, she's able to like, I get her emotions into her art, like speak with her art. She, she, she does that 110%. She puts her heart and passion and emotion into her work. But prolific means um, that she makes a lot of work. Oh, look, here she is. She's joining us back again. So prolific means she, she makes lots of work all the time. Like every day she's making new pieces. There, there probably isn't a day where she isn't making art or thinking of art. So that's what prolific means. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Heidi, we lost you for a minute. Oh, I think she's joining us from her telephone. Maybe her, can't, maybe her computer died. Probably. Maybe the computer died. Oh, it said Heidi's phone did not connect to audio. Okay, so she's trying to connect back in. Um, while she's trying to connect back in, um, I would love to hear the questions that are popping up for you guys. Um, my, my main question in my head is how can she afford to like work in so much art? Rate? That's a really, 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 really good question. Um, I'm just writing that down. Does anyone else? Oops, she's trying to come back in from her phone again. Hi, Heidi. Are you there? She is trying on. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hi, we can hear you. Awesome. My computer died. <laughs> That's what I thought might have happened. I was like, oh, no, I talked too much. And oh, had my computer no. unplugged and it died. <laughs> That's so funny. I really love what you were saying. You were saying such really meaningful, meaningful things about the art making process, in particular, your process. And um, I'm so grateful for everything you were saying. I, I've invited our students to ask some questions. Um, Nicholas has a question for you. And the rest of you think of think of something while we've got while we've got Heidi's time. Um, my question was, oh, I dropped you, Nicholas. I'm sorry. <laughs> my question was, um, how can you afford to work on all your art pieces? That's a really, really great question that we haven't tapped into yet. Um, a couple of different things. Number one, um, when I first got out of art school, um, it was really difficult um, because we, we were fine artists, right? Now art schools really have more business and teach you to actually how, to, how you make money. When I graduated, it basically was like, all right, you're a fine artist. Okay, good luck. It's like, what? Like, all right, like, what do you do now? And this is when computers were just starting out. So it's really different. So now it would be like, I, I'm almost like a generation when I began, computers just started. So I thought, oh, I guess I have to do something with computers, even though I had no idea even how to work on a computer. Graphics wasn't really my background. So I found myself um, going into graphics just because it made sense. Like that's why the fine artists, there's no guarantee of a job, but the graphics, you can do graphic design, you can do something. So I started doing graphic design um, and working for some agencies. And as I said before, I ended up um, getting a job as an art director at L'Oreal, another crazy by chance situation. I thought, you know what, I'm working, um, I worked for the Board of Ed in Brooklyn um, in graphic design and education for a while. So I, that's how I started like 
being able to pay my own rent, to have a job. But then I realized it wasn't inciting enough for me. So I thought, ooh, I better go on some job interviews. So back then you had to look in the New York Times for jobs. So I saw this job that said, yeah, I know, you had to look on the, in the newspaper for a job. Can you believe it? So I said, you know what? I haven't been um, going on interviews. I'm probably bad. Let me go on an interview. And I said, oh, L'Oreal, it's French, it's fashion. I, I love French and fashion. I'll go to this interview. So I go to this interview and they give me the job. And I'm like, what? I didn't even think I could, like I was ready for it. It was a junior design um, for their hair division at L'Oreal. So I ended up saying, all right, I guess I'll take this job. The whole time I worked there, it was really educational. I wasn't comfortable because I'm more of a fine artist than a graphic designer. So I wasn't comfortable, but I kind of felt like it was an acting gig. I knew, you know what, corporate New York, that's not for me, but wow, this is really interesting. I'm learning a lot. This is really interesting to find out how this company was um, formed, um, how it works, their business meetings, marketing. It was a lot of really amazing information, but I knew I'm not staying here long. This is definitely not for me. And then I ended up um, getting, um, I was married and I ended up having my children. So I decided not to work for a while. And luckily, like you said, how do I afford to do that? Luckily, my husband had a job. So I stayed home with the kids for a while and then slowly started getting back into my art. And I first started teaching. I would sell things once in a while, but I had really left the art world and we moved out of the city. So I left all my connections in the fine art world, which wasn't good for a while. But then I was like, all right, I'm home with these two babies. I have to embrace this phase of my life. So I was very creative with them, did a lot of really fun art stuff, but I started teaching. And then the teaching got really big. I started teaching a lot of students, all after school programs, um, homeschool students. And then one day I said, you know what, I have to shift this. Um, I miss the fine art too much. So now I teach a little and I do fine arts a lot. And it was a buildup. It was, um, it was a, oh, you know what it was also is at that particular time, there was a big crash in the market. And all the mid-tier galleries that I started having connections with, because you had to actually go to the gallery and show your work, they all went online. So at that perfect moment, when I was at home with kids, starting to produce my art again, online galleries came up. And they, would, they contacted me and asked if I would put my work on their site. And I said, okay. And then suddenly, that became a really convenient, great way for me to work at home, take care of my children, especially when my husband traveled a lot. And then if my work sold, ship it out. So I didn't have to go to the gallery. I didn't have to make the relations. I didn't have to show up at the openings. I didn't have to bring my work. So for me, the online galleries really helped me continue my career. And then my art was seen. Interior designers found me. Um, galleries, art reps. So because I was out there, on a platform in social media, I was found. So um, I was just lucky ab about when it first started. So I sell a lot of work through Saatchi Art. Um, I was in the beginning, some of the art directors found my work when it was more abstract and Saatchi still owns Saatchi Art. Now it was bought by another company. It's gotten really big. So I started early on. So a lot of the curators know me. So they support my work, they share it. So I get collectors through that. And it's just, again, showing up, being open to possibilities. And then if your work seen, if, then you get more followers. Like Instagram is a great, great medium to have your art on. Great. I don't, I don't hear you if, if you're agreeing, yes, yes, but. Yes, I'm shaking my head. Nicholas. Instagram is huge. I, said, yeah, I, I, said, I, mean, I don't like using Instagram. Well, me either. Let, let, let me explain a little bit about myself. I was so anti-technology. I mean, you can tell by my work. I'm a, I, I don't use digital. I, I mean, I'm definitely a hands-on material fine artist, okay? Was not into social media, didn't want Instagram. A good friend of mine was like, you're crazy. I can't believe you don't have um, an Instagram account. Um, that's what you really should. And I was like, no, no. So she took my phone and within a second, she made an account for me. And I was like, <gasps> I was like completely like all upset and vulnerable. And I didn't like it. I, I was just not into it. And she goes, well, why don't you just follow artists? And I was like, 
oh, all right. So then I started looking up galleries, artists, dance, um, earth, things that I was kind of drawn to. And then I'd put up a sketch. Oh, I like your sketch. Blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly this artist that I knew from Italy, hadn't seen in so long, found me and we started chatting. So then I started going, oh, well, this isn't such a bad space. If I only keep it art and the art that I like and share what I feel like sharing. So my approach to my Instagram account is, and you're, you're welcome to go on it and check it out and say, hey, I heard you and tell me who you are. Um, and I basically use it as a sharing. I use it as a sharing of what I'm making in my studio now. So after about a month, I get this text from some woman and says, is that painting for sale? And I'm like, right, my first thought was, okay, who is this crazy person, right, writing to me through, I didn't even know how to answer my message at first. It was like my son said, why do you have a message? I'm like, oh, I don't know. So I <laughs> look it up. And um, I said, oh, it's going into a show. And she said, it was going into a show in the city. And she's like, can I buy it? And I'm like, what? Like, I wanted to say, what? Are you crazy? Why would you buy a painting on a phone that's a tiny image? And she's like, no, I'd really love it. Uh, is it possible that I buy it before it goes in the show? So I switched the painting out um, with something else. So within a Five hours, she writes, um, great, I want it. Do you have PayPal? She paid for the painting, bought it within like three hours and I shipped it to Australia. And that moment I was like, what? <laughs> the art world has changed completely. I said, that was crazy. She's still my collector. She's bought four pieces since. Yeah. She, I, that was such an education for me. This woman who has money in Australia, saw a painting, she wanted it for her house, and she reached out to me, bypassing art rep, gallery, anything, hoping I wasn't in a gallery, because then I'd have to give the commission to the gallery. So she was working through me because she could. People like talking to artists. They like connecting to artists. So um, if that was with the gallery, I would have given the gallery 50% because they owned the piece. That's what happens, is that you have to give 50% of your um, work to your gallery. So because she found me through my social media, through my studio, that was my full commission. So it was such an education that people buy art online. And to share with you a little bit about um, during this pandemic, um, it was really hard for me at first to go to my studio because I, um, I felt too protected, that I was so safe that I could drive from my house to my studio, see no one in work. And it was really hard for me to embrace that when I knew so many other people were in um, stressful situations, just dealing, going to the supermarket. So I couldn't make art because I'm always like, is it worth it? Am I too selfish making my art? Should I just clean water around the world? Like, am I doing the right thing? And so it makes me question the power of art a lot. And I do believe that art has the power to move people and impact people. And it makes a difference in this world. It really does. So whatever creative process that you have to share, it truly makes a difference. So I found my way back into my studio and I, I mean, I was bummed, but not that bummed, like a bunch of shows were canceled. Okay. And I was like, oh damn, there goes my income that year. Right. However, what happened is everyone at home that wasn't affected in a huge way financially suddenly focused on their home. Um, can I have a commission? Can I buy this? Um, oh, where's your work online? People that are home, spending more time in their home are beautifying their home. So for artists, this weird phase of the pandemic is a selling, selling platform online. Wow. So just something to think about. That's, that's definitely food for thought. I would like to suggest just to piggyback off of something you said earlier, for those of you that do have Instagram accounts, which is probably every single person here, um, if you don't already, make an account that is just for your artwork. Just for your art, don't share oh. anything else. Like I right now, for example, I have one Instagram account and it has my personal photos, it has my artwork, it has stuff that you guys in class are doing, my student work. So my Instagram is just a hodgepodge of stuff. So yeah. to take Heidi's advice, 
make an account that is just for your artwork. And yeah, that's it. Nothing else. You, Only your art. Yeah, you can have someone in Australia reaching out like, wow, this is really hitting a nerve with me and I'm interested in it. And, and so let's, let's definitely um, take, take that. Yeah, and a, way, a way of thinking too is think of it as a sharing. Whenever you approach anything that, oh, it's not monetary, I wanna make a sale, I wanna sell something. If you think about it as sharing, that's why I love teaching. When you teach, you give a lot of yourself, but you get back so much more. I get back so much more from my students than I ever give. So whenever you think of, like I think of my Instagram as a sharing, I'm sharing my process in my studio. And guess what? Sometimes that sharing gets me a commission, gets me a new collector, gets me an art show, new relationships with artists all over the world. So when I'm in my studio, I'm not alone. I connect with other artists, galleries, designers. It's if you think of it in that way and stay only in the art world, it's great. I really like it a lot. It's an amazing marketing tool. Does anyone, Mr. Fogel, you were about to say. Yeah, something. I was gonna ask Heidi, um, what is the importance about being connected to a gallery as an artist? Do you think someone should be connected? Or what, what are the pros and cons of being connected to a gallery? I don't know a lot about it, but I'll share what I do. But I love your mask, by the way. Thank really you. cool graphics. <laughs> It's become a fashionable thing. It's really great. I really like it a lot. It's actually very nice. Some of them I don't like so much. Yeah, That's my best one. friend is a um, designer. He makes custom-made bags and during the pandemic. I can tell. It's, yeah. It's That's a beautiful textile. Mass. Nice. So tell him job That's well done. Um, for me, um, unfortunately, what happened is there's a gallery called Winston Watcher in Chelsea. And it has a lot of women's um, work through the gallery. And they were just about to come to my studio before the pandemic. So I, in this other gallery uptown, because an art rep found me and she wanted me in these galleries. So I was like so excited. Oh, New York City brick and mortar gallery. This is so great. So they still have not come to my studio. So with that being said, I am not signed with a gallery right now. I used to be in some mid-tier galleries um, a, a couple of years ago before they all went down. So right now, I am still looking for a gallery. And it's such a, it's a, a bit of a slippery slope. The online galleries, like I shared before, are really great for me because I had little kids, I was working at home, and it was a great way for me to make money off of my work. Um, the... The reason before the internet, you had to have a gallery because who's seeing your work? Um, where are your collectors? Who's marketing for you? So the gallery did all of that for you. Hence the 50%. They would have an opening. They would share your work um, through any kind of public um, media. So they were really promoting you as an artist. Now, Certain galleries, yeah, it's still really great to have a gallery because they'll have connections that you can never have. Um, it's also really great to be able to have a show. People want to see work in person, not just online. So there's still a lot of really good reasons to have a gallery, but you have to do your homework. Um, go to the galleries that you feel your work would really um, fit well in. Um, make sure that you have a relationship with them. Make sure that it's a real gallery, not a vanity gallery. It has to be a legit gallery. So there's a lot of different things that you need to do um, just to study before you ever would approach a gallery um, and see where your work should be placed. So for me, I have a lot of online galleries internationally and just in the States. And I am still actively looking for a brick and mortar gallery. However, when I do, my prices are gonna go, have to go up. So it kind of changes. Um, a lot of people that are my collectors now may not. So it's this tricky thing is, do I wanna enter that world and increase my prices so much? Or do I wanna kind of stay in both? So I'm slowly moving towards that. That's the phase that I'm in. That's interesting. And I wonder how that will work with, let's say you were to commit to one brick and mortar gallery what happens then with your own personal ability to sell directly to people? Let's say with Instagram, for example, like are you still allowed to sell your own work to 
you know, Bob from New Jersey who just found you yesterday and wants mm -hmm. to buy your painting today on PayPal. You know, is that still viable? Well, legally, years ago, just so a lot of your students, they may not even know this, that um, say it was years ago, if I had a gallery, anything I sell, 50% goes to them, whether it's a sketch to my grandma out of my studio, if it was a ceramic, anything, they own everything. And you would have to give them 50%. This is years ago, which I always thought was kind of outrageous, um, that you would have to give 50%. Even now, if you were selling it to your neighbor, yeah. you still were oh, yeah. committed to if give If you were represented by a gallery, and this is when we graduated from school, Soraya. This is back in the 80s, 90s. Okay. Um, I don't know legally when it changed because now it's very different because of the online galleries. So what you generally do, and this is what I do, I ask every person that approaches me and finds my art, how did you find me? Okay, that's the first thing you say, how did you find me? I found you through Sachi. Sachi gets that commission. I found you through Natasha, your art rep. Natasha gets that commission. I found you through um, the Artling, um, the Shanghai um, Gallery. They get the commission. Because if you don't do that, sometimes you have to pay that commission to get more work. If they say, I found you through Instagram. Oh, from Jane so-and-so. Oh, okay. Your price has to be the same. In your studio, in the gallery, online. Your price has to be the same the whole time. Do I have a friends and family discount when people come to my studio? Absolutely. But your price has to be the same. If you have different prices on different platforms, it's going to get you in trouble. So this and if you don't pay the source, if they find out that you had their client come to your studio and you sold out of your studio without giving them, that you're, you're gone. This sounds you're, like, you're, similar to, um, to real estate. So my mother yeah. and my sister both sell homes. And mm -hmm. it sounds like a similar treatment of that commodity, legal treatment, yeah. I think. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, a great question. Um, do you watermark your work? Watermark it? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I, I don't even know if I know 100% what the watermark is. I love that. Like, I think I want to. And explain, to, teach, teach Heidi something. What is a watermark? What are you talking about, Nick? You mean the imprint in my paper? It's like, if you're putting work online on like Instagram, you put like, you put a few like prints over it so that someone can't just like screenshot it, like they actually have to buy it from you. They can't just steal your work. No, you, you know what? I, I guess I, I don't really worry about that too much because it's too low res. If they had my high res image, um, yeah, like, like, uh, um, like here's an example. Uh, a lot of hospitality interior designers, sometimes they'll ask if they can blow up a sold painting really large in a print. They pay me for my high res image. You can't, you can't print anything good off of a tiny little low. So if you have low res online, no one's going to be, um, it, you know what I mean? And, and you mm -hmm. can copy anyone's stuff. If you're like, if you spend too much time worried that someone's going to copy you, um, anyone can copy you. You, you, can, you, like, you know what I mean? Anyone can copy you. Um, they, can, they can steal anything they want from a visual image. Um, I think you sh should really focus more on what you're actually doing and what you're gonna do next. But if you worry too much that you're gonna be um, like you're, it, it, it's like you can always have a copyright on something, but I don't put stuff like that on my images because I also, um, people know me, they know my work, I've been written about. If someone steals my work, they're, they're, um, they're uh, gonna be ruined, not me. You know, like you, you can't do that, it's illegal. But um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, especially if it's low res. That's a great question. So he was referring But you could put something on it. Like, I'm not sure what kind of work you're talking about. Like, if you're doing something digital, like, I, I'm talking about fine art photograph of a painting. Like, if you're speaking to some other form of art, um, you might be absolutely right. And you need something on it um, because they can steal the identity of it. So I'm not 100% sure in all the different aspects of different type of work. But it's a, it is a great question because... Mm -hmm as artists w that, that post on Instagram or anywhere online, um, you know, plagiarism and um, yeah, the digital watermark does, does protect um, some work and certainly the work of um, 
new artists and I know photographers mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sounds like a great idea. I mean, if I had an assistant, I'd be like, yeah, can you do that for me? <laughs> I don't have enough time. <laughs> but it's a really, really great question, Nicholas. Um, so unfortunately we have to end this session. Um, I'm so, so grateful for your time and everything you said. It was really great to learn more about your work from hearing you speak about it because I've been watching your work progress over the years, but I don't think I've ever heard many of the things that you've um, discussed. So um, I do want to see, does anyone else have any questions before, before Heidi leaves? When did you start making art? When did I start making art? Yeah, like what inspired you? Like, yeah, people ask that question a lot. And I think that, um, I don't think it was like when I started it, I think I've always, like I said before, I was always a visual thinker. So for me, um, whether it was making mud pies in my backyard or um, sewing a little puppet or when I was a kid or the way I built with my Lincoln logs, I was always creating something. And I just naturally evolved into falling into this world called the fine art world, where you make art that people purchase. So I don't think I've changed that much. I just kind of evolved into it. Um, but seriously creating work was probably when I shifted um, into starting to create that portfolio. I di was directing my time and efforts for a purpose, which was to get into art school. Thank you. Andre, good question. Anyone else? No. I don't think I have any more questions. Oh, I don't have one more question. Um, can you talk some more about, like, I think you said you worked in the field of graphic um, design for a little bit, even though it wasn't cut up for you. Like, can you tell uh -huh. me, like, how that was? Yeah, um, sure. Well, I, um, most art schools have um, the first year, it's called foundation. So you basically um, kind of learn a lot about everything. Like, they, like you would do drawing, sculpture, printmaking. And then we also did graphic design. Like that was a, an elective. Um, so I knew how to do all of that um, type of design um, on paper. And like I said, the computer was, was brand new. So um, I found myself kind of learning the computer with some skills that I had because it was easy to um, work in graphic design more than getting your first show as a painter. I mean, that's, that's a huge leap. So um, I naturally just found myself working in graphic design and I was attracted to um, art and ed. That's why I worked at the Board of Ed. I liked kids and art and education. So that's why I picked that particular graphic design job. Um, if I was more um, akin to like music or um, sports or um, theater, I might've picked something different in graphic design. So I made sure that I picked something I was kind of interested in, even though I wasn't really good at graphic design, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot and it also helped me with my own marketing for my own work. Um, and then I worked at a little agency for a while, um, a graphic design agency. And then I found the job at L'Oreal, which was more exciting for me because um, you were really connected to fashion and fashion absolutely trickles into everything. It, it moves the art world. So I loved being yeah, involved in fashion. Yeah, so I always picked graphic design of some interest that I liked. And it was like beauty, fashion, um, well-being. And I liked that it was a French international company. So you learn a lot when a company's international. So, um, however, I was not really good at it. I was good, good enough to have a salary, but I knew it wasn't where my heart was. And that's why I switched to fine arts. So oh, I have to, pardon me, my phone is saying, let's, um, let's stop that. So I wanted to just, um, before we end, you, you said something early on that when you went to Pratt, you just studied fine arts and that you wished that you had gone to a school that was more multidisciplinary. So mm -hmm. I actually have the same personal experience. When I went to Parsons, I also focused on fine arts, painting in particular, when I graduated in 92, I taught myself the Mac. I became a graphic designer also because I needed a job. And um, it was a good way to be creative and get a salary. 
Um, but what I want to say is that I know that art schools, not only art schools, but but colleges that have art programs are much more multidisciplinary than they used to be. And so now when you guys go off to college, you're gonna have the opportunity to kind of like at a buffet, you can kind of a la carte and mm -hmm. pick classes that do interest you. And you're not going to be um, pigeonholed into one particular um, type of art making. You right. know, when I was at Parsons, the students, we had to choose. Was it going to be industrial design or fine arts or graphic design? It wasn't um, this and that and that. And now colleges are recognizing that life and careers are interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So you mm -hmm. really... My, my parting advice is that you guys really um, take all of those electives and things that you think you may or may not be interested in and to, as Heidi said, to allow yourself to be in that uncomfortable place. Um, so hopefully, did that help answer your question, Nick? Yeah. Nicholas did an amazing, amazing internship at a place called Career Gear um, oh, great. At, at this really amazing um, fashion place downtown. Um, internships are the best. Like we didn't really have that when we were in college. So benefit from those internships. You learn so much, you make lifelong connections. And here's something interesting that my professor said to me at Pratt and said to the whole class, one day he said, look around the room, look at every person in this room. He goes, they're gonna be your peers. They're going to be your job connects. They're going to be your connections in the art world. And it's really true. Look at the people around you now. When you find yourself moving into a career in the art world, these are your peers. Connect back to the people that you've met. Always follow through on a connection. Great, great, great advice. Um, so my students have to go on to their next class. Um, Heidi, Thank you so, so, so very much. This was amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much. It was so nice uh, meeting you all and sharing and I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk okay, soon. Nice okay, great. Bye. Bye.